Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Krista Rowland and I serve as the Director of Program Standards at the Kentucky Department of Education. We know that high quality instructional resources or HQIR as we call them, allow students to engage more deeply and meaningfully with the Kentucky Academic Standards and supports teachers in ensuring all students have access to high quality and rigorous grade level content. Student outcomes improve when they have greater access to grade appropriate assignments, strong instruction, deep engagement, and teachers with high expectations. HQIR provides teachers with a foundational resource that ensures all students have access to rigorous grade level content. We appreciate the role that you play in bringing HQIR to students in your district. In today's session, you will hear from several KDE team members who will be sharing critical information for your district and you in your role as HQIR coordinator. You will learn more about HQIR adoption in Kentucky including See, why resources matter, legislation impacting early literacy curriculum requirements for your district, the HQIR fall survey and dashboard, as well as opportunities to collaborate in the future. We appreciate your engagement today and ask that you share this information with others in your district who may need to know more about HQIR in Kentucky. Hey, good morning, everyone. I am Fox DeMoise, and I'm joined by Misty Higgins, and we are professional learning coordinators here in the Division of Program Standards at KDE. And we're going to be thinking together in this segment about why high-quality instructional resources matter. So vibrant student learning experiences and deeper learning are at the ultimate and tenth level of our standards, but we recognize schools and districts need some support in implementing the standards at the local level in a way that can truly impact the classroom experience for our students. So on the slide is a visual representation of critical actions necessary for this to occur. And it really focuses on the movement from vision to the impacts that we're after of high quality instruction and improved student outcomes. So the first step is for districts to ensure they have a common instructional vision in place for the content area of focus. Then based on that vision, they need to equip teachers and students with access to high quality local curriculum supported by high quality instructional resources that provide the necessary tools to then actualize or reach that vision. Um, and we know that simply giving educators a high quality instructional resource is not enough to support them in making the instructional shifts necessary to provide vibrant student experiences for all students. They need to engage in high quality professional learning as well. So professional learning that builds the understandings and skills that are a part of high quality instruction for every student. When districts intentionally ensure these pieces are in place, then we see the full impact on instruction and on student outcomes. So why are we placing emphasis on high quality instructional resources or HQIRs in our work? We wanna take just a few minutes here to highlight some of the research on the adverse effects of teachers and students not having access to HQIRs and then on the positive impacts of when they do. So as we move through the next few slides, we would like for you to make note of what resonates with you about why resources matter, and then also of any information or any data that surprises you or really strikes you. So please feel free to grab a piece of paper to capture your thinking, or if you want to open up a Word or a Google Doc to jot it down digitally, that will work as well. But just know you're going to be invited at the end of this segment to share your thoughts. And so getting a few of them down as we go might be helpful. I'll give you a moment to get set up. Okay. So Research tells us that teachers spend about seven hours per week, and that adds up to 250 hours per year creating or curating resources. So when they're looking for resources, we know they tend to go to places like Google or Teachers Pay teacher, Teachers or, or Pinterest, just to name a few. And this results in the, un, in, in the use of unvetted resources that are often low in quality and lead to inequities in the student learning experience. So the, the graphs on this slide illustrate how these resources, whether they're found or made, tend to fall short. So in the first graph, looking at grade level alignment, we see that teacher created or selected resources are aligned to grade level standards only about 20% of the time. 
What about subject specific practices? Only 13% of teacher created or selected assignments allow students access to those disciplinary practices. And in terms of authentic connection, only 16% of teacher created or selected assignments help students make rich connections to big ideas and to the world around them. So when reviewers evaluated supplemental materials found online for depth of knowledge for DOK, and we know DOK is the cognitive demand required for students to successfully engage with content, most of the content included in the main activity of each was DOK level one or two. So that falls at the level of recall and reproduction of basic skills and knowledge. Nearly half of the main activities had no DOK level three content at all. So that's that strategic and critical thinking we want for our students. And 94% had no DOK level four content that extended and applied thinking. What is the impact of this on student on the student experience? This, this adds up to inconsistent access to grade level work. So students are spending 581 of 720 hours, and that's equivalent to about 81% of a school year on assignments that are not grade level appropriate. This is particularly significant for students of color and students who are economically disadvantaged. So clearly this becomes a matter of equity. And there are implications beyond high school as well. So 40% of college students take at least one remedial course. Now these courses cover content that should have been mastered in high school. And oftentimes students and families think this content has been mastered in high school. And when, those, when they encounter those remedial courses, it comes at a cost to students and their families, a cost to the tune of about 1.5 billion annually. So this also impacts our students going into the workforce out of high school with business and industry partners telling us students are missing skills needed for employability. So Fox just talked about what happens when teachers and students do not have access to HQIRs. However, when teachers have access to and effectively implement HQIRs, research shows that it results in improvement in teacher practice and gains in student achievement. So for example, a 2017 study showed that the effect of using an HQIR is the same as moving an average performing teacher to one at the 80th percentile. And a 2018 study showed that teachers that were using a high quality math instructional resource, they engaged their students in the mathematical practices at a significantly higher rate than teachers that didn't have access to an HQIR. And this really connects to supporting that deeper learning by students engaging in the practices of the content. And while this study looked at math specifically, this would likely hold true for other content areas as well because of the intentional research-based design of HQIRs and their emphasis on engaging students in the practices of the discipline. And then we've also heard about the impact of HQIRs on teachers and students right here in Kentucky from those districts participating in our reading and writing and math pilots. So some of the common benefits that they've shared with us in terms of just the impact on teachers, um, they've talked about how it's really freed up teachers' time to leverage the key aspects of the HQIR and its built-in supports to truly meet the individual needs of their students, and how teachers are really raising their expectations of what their students students are able to know and do, regardless of the ability of background, as they consistently put grade level task and text in front of them. And in terms of the impact that they're seeing on their students, the districts pointed to how the HQIR is really helping to build the necessary background knowledge that students need to engage in that grade level content. And it's introducing them to places, cultures, and experiences that they may not have otherwise had access or exposure to, especially those from lower SES. And it's also increased like students' in or interest and their confidence in learning as they engage with that challenging material. And parents in these districts have even shared with the teachers and leaders how their students are coming home and they're talking about what they're learning and what they're reading in class that day. So going back to our initial question, so we looked at the need for HQIRs and the potential impact when uh, teachers and students have access to them. What were maybe some things from the slide that really resonated with you and or what information seemed especially surprising? 
So we would like for everyone just to post something you noted in the chat. So one thing that maybe really stood out to you, really resonated with you, or seemed especially surprising. So we'll pause and give you some time now. Once you have that in mind, go ahead and type and post it in the chat. how it frees up time for teachers at the amount of time that teachers spend just trying to curate or create their own resources. Yeah. Lots of time on lower level resources. Yeah. I love it. Having HQIRs give teachers some time back. The sense that time spent on pedagogy um, without an HQIR is less, that it's not um, as, as much of a focus, the impact beyond high school. So lots of things that are coming into the chat right now. And would anyone feel comfortable coming off of mute and maybe elaborate a little bit more on something you posted? So please feel free to unmute if you would like to elaborate just a little bit more. Hey, this is Janabeth Francis, and I love that you all pulled up this research from TNTP. And what I would say is I think to me, when you have an HQIR, it allows the teacher to not spend time creating a resource, but to actually get to what I believe is high quality pedagogy. And that is, what do I know about my students? What do I know about teaching this content? And how can I put all that together? It just seems like there's still this sense that if I'm not designing and creating lessons, then I'm not teaching. And so I think there's a core belief that has to shift. Very well said. Thank you. Other thoughts that people would like to share, elaborating just a little more on what you posted. Joshua DeBoard, I would like to say, I think the point of the ability to bring newer teachers, alternative certified teachers, or lower performing teachers up to a high baseline, a foundation, has made a major impact um, for us and several other districts I've talked to as well. Thank you, Josh. And Josh is from one of our reading and writing pilot districts. And again, Josh, to your point, just how this supports that changing teacher workforce that all of us are experiencing at the district level. Other thoughts? Okay, so we know that HQIRs are a critical part of providing a vibrant learning experience and improving student outcomes, but what do we mean when we say that something is a high quality instructional resource? So like what are the characteristics that you would want to look for in a resource to see if it is in fact an HQIR? So let's look at how KDE is defining HQIRs. So please take just a moment and read through the six characteristics that are included in KDE's definition of high quality instructional resources. So we know to kind of start us out here this morning, that was a quite a bit, a lot of information to already take in. So what we want to do now is to give you all just a few minutes in breakout rooms um, to share around HQIR. So it's specifically, we want you to discuss the question that you see here on the slide. So what connections do you see to the work in your district, your role, and the ways that HQIRs can help meet the needs of teachers and students in your district? So before we send you into your rooms, we do want to pause here for just a minute and give you a little bit of think time around that question. So breakout rooms are now going to open and we just ask that you please equitably share airtime in your breakout room to allow others opportunities to share and we will see you all back here in about eight minutes. All right. Welcome back, guys. I hope you had some good discussions in your breakout rooms about the connections and why HQIR uh, can better meet the needs of your educators and students 
in your district. We're going to spend just a few minutes um, talking about the Read to Succeed Act and high quality instructional resources and some in the law. Uh, my name is Christy Biggerstaff and I'm the Director of Early Literacy for the Kentucky Department of Education. And when I talk about Read to Succeed, I always start with the why. Uh, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I bring out this data a lot. Uh, and it is essentially the why we are focusing on early literacy and its connections to high quality instructional resource. So as you see on the screen there, we have the K-PREP and KSA results for the last several years in Kentucky. Um, I could pull back for multiple years because the data trend line is all the same. You can see from 2015 to 2019, essentially half of the students in the state of Kentucky are at proficient levels, which means that half of the students of the state of Kentucky are not at proficient or distinguished levels. None of us are okay when we think about half of our students in our entire state not meeting the level of proficiency and, and being a proficient reader and then sending them on to the next level. Now, I must say, this is third grade reading proficiency. Uh, we know the significance of third grade reading proficiency in our state. We know that if they are proficient, by that point, they're less likely to have issues with attendance, with dropout, with behavior, juvenile crime. Uh, they are more likely to have continued academic success. I would argue that literacy is the foundation for all the other content. So ensuring that they have a very uh, proficient, uh, they, they know their literacy foundations and their proficient readers, then they will have continued success. Of course, COVID came in in 2020 and did exactly what we knew COVID was going to do, and that rate dropped significantly. In 2022, it bounced back a little bit, um, but again, nowhere near where we want that to be. I will add that since the release of our uh, KSA proficiency results yesterday, that did increase a little, but again, nowhere near where we need it to be. If we look at some of the subgroups uh, a little further into the data, you can see there on the screen that the Black students in the state of Kentucky, 75% of them are not at proficient levels. I see this data so often, I talk about this data so often, but every single time this slide comes up, it is a moral imperative at this point that we do something different with literacy instruction with our instructional resources that we are using. Because obviously and clearly what we are doing in our state is not working. We have to think differently about the way we teach literacy. And I think, you know, th that entire uh, thought process has to do with what do they say that the uh, definition of crazy is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. We have to think differently about the way we teach. So let's dive into um, a little activity. And I'm going to ask you to just play along with me for just a few minutes. So I'm going to challenge you today to design your own creation. So think about, I'm going to give you a piece of text, and I want you to think about during that text what you are going to design today. And I want you to think about who you're going to design it for, what features you'll include, your evidence. Think about that from the passage. So I'm going to put up the passage, and I'm going to be quiet for just a few minutes as you read. Would any brave soul like to unmute and just throw out your best guess? Please, if you've seen this passage before, don't, don't speak up and ruin it for everybody else. But if you have a guess on maybe what we are designing today, would you unmute and let us know what your guess is? Topiaries. Topiaries. I get that one. I get that one a lot. Great guess, but that's incorrect. Does anybody else have a guess? Homes. Do what? Homes, houses. Good guess, but no. 
I tell you what, let's do this. That passage in front of you is actually at what a kid sees when they have about a 70% accuracy rate uh, in while they're reading a passage. Let me give you just a few more words and see if that will help you out. Did that help anyone? Does anybody else want to come off of mute and maybe give me a guess? Like trails, nature trails. A great guess. Absolutely. But that is incorrect. That on the screen that you're seeing is at an 80% accuracy rate. And that should sound uh, quite familiar to the district folks because we usually say um, and really target 80% accuracy or 80% mastery. But really in the world of literacy, we want 100% so they can actually read the passage. So I'm going to give that to you. And if you, you will look at the next or the next to the last sentence, what would you do if you could design your own maze? Mm -hmm. So that would be incredibly difficult if you were a student in a class and you cannot access the text. In order to participate in that activity, you really need to be able to, to have a good understanding about what you're reading and what the information is telling you. And that is exactly what is happening to our students across the state of Kentucky. We are giving them uh, text and they can't access that text. They can't access that learning because they're not reading at 100% accuracy rate, even a 90% accuracy rate, because our data shows that 50% of our students in the state of Kentucky, or even less, according to the, the later data, are not reading at proficient or distinguished levels. So what does that mean in terms of high quality instructional resource? Well, there was a change to Senate Bill 156 in 2023 that impacted the Read to Succeed Act, which is KRS 158305. And there was a word change, and it's a significant words change. We all know in education that words matter. So on that first line, it says the law establishes by July 1st, 2024, each superintendent shall adopt a common comprehensive reading program. Now, I'm going to stop. And that change happened when they inserted the word shall from May. So it used to say each superintendent may adopt a common comprehensive reading program. And that changed to shall in, in uh, 23. So that means that we have to have a comprehensive reading program for our kindergarten through grade three in our schools or subset of schools. And you might be thinking July 1st, 2024 is a long way away. In all actuality though, we really need to um, think about this and talk about this in our districts because the urgency needs to be there. If we do not have a high quality instructional resource and a comprehensive reading program in our schools, July, 20, uh, July 1, 2024 is coming quickly because that process takes some time. Just to go a little further into the law, I want you to see all pieces of that. Common means K through three, as I said, and a comprehensive reading program is just that. It's a it's one that identifies and addresses all parts of the literacy instruction, which is phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. All of those are vital and must be present in a comprehensive reading program. So high quality instructional materials in literacy um, again need to change. And we have to impact those numbers that we first talked about. So you can see on your screen on the right hand side, this is what our comprehensive reading programs uh, look like or have looked like up until this point and what needs to change if you've not adopted a high quality instructional resource in your district. So you can see that it's based on the whole word, uh, whole word method or balanced literacy. It's got memorization tact tactics. It's simplistic. It's repetitive text. It's disconnected text and readers. On the left-hand side of your screen, that is what a high-quality instructional resource in literacy looks like. It has authentic, com complex text. It's standards aligned. It has decodables. It's evidence-based. It's got a scope and a sequence for phonics. 
So we must move to a high quality instructional resource in literacy to again, flip the script with our literacy instruction in the state of Kentucky. Just to go a little bit deeper, the foundational skills are imperative to your high quality instructional resource, your comprehensive reading program. The foundational skill development within an HQIR should be aligned, explicit, and systematic in its instruction. No longer can we rely upon the letter a day or a letter a week in our um, classrooms. That is ineffective. We have to have a clear scope and sequence for instruction to teach those foundational skills. And we also have to spend a significant and appropriate amount of time on those foundational skills. Because if we only spend just a few minutes of our day, we're not building out that knowledge and that foundation in order to help ensure that our students are successful. Now, you might be thinking, well, how if you do not have an adopted high quality instructional resource in your district, you know, what resources are out there in order to help districts do that? I'm going to turn it back over to Fox, who's going to go through some of those resources that we have developed for our districts. Thank you. <clears throat> so coming back now to the visual we took a look at earlier, we can see following from the first step toward improving student outcomes in a given content area, that first step of ensuring there is a common instructional vision in place, Space 2 looks at providing access to strong local curriculum and HQIR to help actualize that vision. Katie's two primary tools available to support this work are our curriculum development process and our instructional resources consumer guides. So we currently have the reading, writing, and math guides available, um, and then we have plans to release the science consumer guide this coming spring. So the curriculum development process is section one of the model curriculum framework. And this guidance lays out a process districts can use to develop and implement a strong local curriculum supported by high quality instructional resources. So the first phase of the CDP is, is largely like preparatory or and logistical in nature. And it focuses on just readying for the process. Phase two provides guidance on articulating a local instructional vision that reflects the Kentucky academic standards current research for teaching and learning in the, in the content area of focus, and a district's local context, that mix of, of local needs and initiatives that really should inform resource selection. Phase three, step one, provides guidance using the instructional vision to drive selection of a primary HQIR to anchor the local curriculum. This step is where the content area consumer guides fit in, so if the CDP itself focuses on more general guidance, the consumer guides provide content specific characteristics of high quality instructional resources. So this slide gives us a, a sense of the layout and organization of the reading writing consumer guide um, that you can use to support your district's work around Senate Bill 156. The introduction provides some background context, connections to the CDP, and then spotlights the importance of HQIRs. The second section focuses on the specific characteristics of high quality reading and writing instructional resources. And it starts with the KDE's general definition of HQIRs, then focuses on what that looks like in reading and writing. The markers specifically point to characteristics of a reading and writing resource that you wanna to use to evaluate in order to ensure alignment to the Kentucky Academic Standards for Reading and Writing. Then the equity lenses offer specific reading and writing look for us to help you in evaluating resources in order to ensure they are culturally relevant, free from bias, and accessible for all students. The final section outlines a four-step local selection process. Each step will include a brief description, key questions to consider, and then key tools to support the work. A common question we get is where to identify and evaluate potential HQIRs. And part of KDE's general definition of HQIRs is that they are externally validated and or research-based and comprehensive in nature. So to support steps two and three of the local selection process, the consumer guide will point you to ed reports. 
And in case you're not familiar with Ed Reports, they are a nonprofit organization that's often described as like the consumer reports of instructional resources. <clears throat> they are a for educator, by educator, educator organization, and they publish free reviews of K-12 instructional resources using an educator-led approach that's going to measure for things like standards alignment, usability, and other quality criteria. And they review for-profit, non-profit, as well as open education resources. Um, their curriculum teams consist of five practicing educators that are selected for their content area expertise, and they reflect a diversity of roles, regions, and grade levels. And those reviewers spend over 150 hours reviewing each resource, and every reviewer on the team has to review every single page of the resource. So we just want to show you a quick snapshot of their website and how you can start your navigation of looking at potential K-3 reading and writing HQIRs. So on their homepage at the top under report or explore reports, you would want to select ELA. Then you're going to focus in on their filters to begin the process of identifying and evaluating potential HQIRs. And in order to ensure that you are starting with resources that meets KDE's definition of HQIRs, you would need to filter out resources that meet expectations for both alignment, so that's alignment to the standards, and then usability. So really looking at the teacher and student embedded supports. And that's going to give you a list of what's considered green rated resources. And so everything that would populate in the list at that point would be everything that would be a possible consideration in terms of being green rated. And then as you view that list, you do want to make sure that you focus on those that are marked as core comprehensive to ensure alignment back to Senate Bill 156. Now, the consumer guide, it includes a video tutorial and other resources to support districts in navigating Ed Reports website um, to help you in identifying and evaluating those potential green rated HQIRs for adoption consideration. So once again, we want to give you all an opportunity to just process that kind of chunk of information that we've shared back in your breakout rooms, and we're going to focus on these two questions. So where are you in the process toward adopting a K-3 comprehensive reading HQIR? And then what resources did you see from what we shared that might be useful in your district to support the evaluation and selection process? So we'll pause, give you a little bit of think time here around those questions. So where are you in that adoption process? of a K-3 comprehensive reading and writing HQIR and what resources that we showed might be helpful. So just think about those questions. So we're going to open back up the breakout rooms. And once again, please just remember to equitably share that airtime in your breakout rooms. And we'll see you all back here in about five minutes. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Davidson. Um, just want to welcome everybody back from their breakout rooms. And um, I believe at this point, everyone should be kind of back joining us. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about our fall survey for HQIR. Um, and then my colleague, Ben Maynard, is also going to be talking about the HQIR uh, dashboard that we've created, which some of you may already have access to. Um, our fall survey collection is going to open today. Um, you will be receiving an email today that um, includes specific links to some of the things I'm going to show you today, but we thought that we would go over the process in this meeting and just kind of prep you and help you feel comfortable with what's going on. Um, this year, we do have a new um, district level survey. It just needs to be filled out by one coordinator in your district. So if your district happens to have multiple coordinators, which if you do, please um, coordinate with each other and decide who's going to fill out that one district level survey. Um, that just has some questions about curriculum based professional learning. And we're really, um, you know, the department, we're moving into that space and um, giving guidance around that. And we'd really like to kind of get a sense of where everyone's at so that we know how we can best support. Um, at the school level, we have similar to last year, we have one for reading and writing in ELA. This will be the third year that that goes out. And then this year, the mathematics survey, um, there's also a few questions around science in there. We do ask that even if you've, um, you know, responded to the survey in the past, 
and nothing's changed, we do ask that you do uh, just respond to the survey again and let us know what you're still using. We have added a few questions this year regarding um, how long resources have been in use in your schools. And so um, we'd just really like to get all of that information from you. And um, you know, just having that is really uh, helpful for us to help support you guys again. So we we really want to say thank you in advance for your participation. We had great participation last year, even better than the year before, and we're hoping that this year is even better. Um, if you do work in a large district, um, you know, around 10 or more schools, we know it can be burdensome to fill out one form for each school for each of the subjects. So we, we will have an option for you. You can reach out to me. My email address is gonna be at the end of the presentation um, and will also be included when we send the email out. Just let us know and we'll set you up with a way to do things a little more easily. I'm gonna pop out now and just show you um, our collection site. So for those of you who have done this before, this should look a little familiar. Um, Basically, you'll come to this site and it has everything that you will need. We strongly recommend starting with our planning sheets. I'm going to pop one open. You can either um, use the Google Sheet version and make a copy. And um, for example, you could share this through Google with the principals at your schools and ask them to help fill out pieces of this for you just to kind of collect all the information that you need before you submit. Um, this year we have all, everything you need is all in one workbook. So it pops up with the district level survey first. Um, so you'll see that again, just one person in the, the district needs to submit that for us. Um, there's an, a reading, writing, English language arts collector and math science um, collector. And let me show you, um, also we have these resource lists. So as Misty was just showing you on Ed Reports, this first column, um, shows all of your green rated resources. The way that the survey is set up, it will ask you first if you're using one of those. Um, that just kind of helps us classify who's using green rated resources at this point in time. And if you're not, don't worry, that's okay. Um, you know, there, it's not, there's no judgment in the process. We just kind of want to get a sense of who's using what at this point. Um, for reading and writing, we do also have a list of other commonly um, in use resources that we got from the first year when people are answering. And then for K through three schools, we do have um, questions about screener and diagnostics. So those are listed there as well. Um, so those will just kind of, if you want to look at those first, that'll help you prep. And then you would come in here and fill out all the questions. Um, these are neat little Oh, it's just in the uh, preview, so it's not showing me, but you would click on these and it will have the drop down with all of the um, options that you can um, fill out. So again, if you're, you know, if it's just a K through five school, you only have to answer the K through five questions um, and so on. Um, let me pop back over here. As I said, the, um, you have the Google Sheets version or you can download, download that as an Excel copy um, and email it if you uh, prefer to work in that way. Um, we do have instructions up here. I'm not gonna go over all of these now, but just know that this is here for you when you get to the point where you're ready. If you need a refresher on what to do, it'll take you through step through step. Um, we have a little blurb about what's new this year um, that I've gone over with you already. And then when you're ready to start submitting, Oh goodness, there you go. Um, this piece right here is gonna be customized to you. So you can see I've been assigned to the Bayside District and I've got my Bayside Elementary and Bayside High here. And if you're wondering if we're referencing pop culture from our childhoods, you are correct, we are. Um, so what you would do is just click on these and this will open up and kind of pre-populate for you, your school district, the school level surveys, pre-populate um, the school. So just easy as pie to get in here. Once you've finished a survey, it'll let you know that that one's done. And here again, it's populated the district and the school. And then you just click through, yes, I want that. Just click through and um, fill out 
all of the questions. It does match one for one with the planning sheet. So that should make it super, super easy for you guys to follow. Um, yeah, that, that is the gist. And like I said, when you get the email, it's going to give you a link to the site and you can go ahead and start getting your planning sheets in order and be ready to submit as you are able. I'm going to pop back in here real quick. Excuse me while this loads. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Ben, to talk to you about the HQIR District Coordinator Hub. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, yeah, so through all your responses, you know, that Karen just kind of walked you through the process as we collect those responses. I know last year we were able to, the for the first time, really create a district coordinator hub. And so we want to talk to you briefly about that because we plan to do the same thing this year. And we're going to tell you a little bit about how that works. And so, um, so you'll see here, um, here in just a minute how you can search for other coordinators across the state to encourage collaboration around common resources or even ones uh, you're considering for adoption because i know that season is coming up quickly um, and because you are voluntarily submitting these resources we do greatly appreciate your privacy and, re and respect that so that's why we, re we reserve access to the hub for those of you that are appropriately identified in kde's open house as the hkr coordinator and as well as those of you that complete the surveys. And so, but if you, uh, but if you wanna to respond to the survey, but not quite ready for anyone else to see um, your school or district resources, we totally get that. Um, we'll give you the opportunity to opt out of having your school's resources included in the updated version of the dashboard that we're planning to do um, at the close of this year's window. And, and for those of you that participate in this year's round of surveys, we'll, um, we'll add you to the dashboard, um, which we anticipate opens up in early 2024, which is crazy to think it's 2024. So just quickly now, we want to show you a couple of screenshots um, because we're going to have an opportunity in a few minutes. Um, Karen, if you want to keep sharing and click over to the next slide. Absolutely. Thank you. So. Um, so just quickly, uh, we just want to show you just a couple of screenshots. We'll get interactive in a few minutes. You'll learn about those opportunities here and for some breakout rooms uh, here shortly. But um, those of you that submitted last year, you know, we were able to create this dashboard. And so um, if you have access and you've used it in some way over the last year, uh, let us know in the chat you know, just quickly while we're talking through what you, what you maybe you found helpful, because that will probably help the folks that's never seen it, that don't currently have access and hopefully kind of incentivize um, some responses for us as well. And so just quickly, you know, this is that will be the opening page. It has quick hitting info about HQR, some of the things that you've already heard it say, but we want to also package that in one place for you, because it'll be handy once you start looking at resources um, on some of the subsequent pages. So, and at the bottom, just kind of in the rectangle there in the red rectangle, you can see that's where, and we'll, we'll probably adjust this a little for the 2024 version, but the feature will still be there. We wanna make sure that you can look for and find other coordinators across the state to help kind of encourage that community um, of practice around resources. So you can discuss, collaborate, um, and get to know uh, those resources and, and the implementation better. So that's perfect. So. Um, yeah, next slide. Thank you. So, and just quickly here, you'll see that um, on pages two, three, and four, uh, we have it broken down by K5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. And so you'll be able to search for entire districts, look for schools um, that are included, and then you'll even be able to kind of in the red rectangle there, you can see how it will function on each page where you can really look down that list of green rated resources and see how many schools selected that. And so that you can identify, hey, the, this may be, I know this coordinator, I know this district, would love to talk to them about how that implementation is going for them. So just kind of a, a way to kind of zero in, narrow in on things that you're considering or things that you're currently using and to be able to connect with uh, a coordinator in that district. So you can kind of see how that all comes together to help kind of encourage um, some collaboration uh, around these resources. And so, but like I said, if you want to get in depth a little bit more to the dashboard, you're going to learn in just a couple of minutes how to do that with us uh, today. And so, Laura, I'm going to hand it back to you so you can kind of tell everyone about those uh, opportunities. 
Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks, Karen. Um, good morning, everybody. Like Ben said, my name is Laura. Um, I believe I've met most of you on the call. Um, today, you have heard quite a bit of information um, in what seems like a really short amount of time from our discussion early on about navigating ed reports, information on read to succeed, and highlights on utilizing the HQI da HQIR dashboard. Uh, we now want to spend some time digging deeper into each one of those main topics that we've discussed. We know that each different each district is at very different points and phases of this process um, and may need more information on something specific. So what we are going to do for breakout rooms, um, it's going to look a little bit different than the first two, is we are going to have three different rooms, um, and you'll see them listed here on your screen. The first room, you will be able to get a little bit more information and discuss further resources to support local adoption and navigating ed reports. The second room, uh, you will be able to focus on HQIRs and read to succeed with Christy. And then the third room, as Ben just said, you will be looking a little bit deeper at the fall survey and the HQIR dashboard. So we've We've talked about calling it the choose your own adventure, um, and we hope that this time can be really individualized and intentional for you to get in, have a deeper conversation with some of your colleagues, and uh, get more information that you need at this moment. So I am going to go ahead and open up the rooms, um, and you should be able to choose them as soon as they are open. Welcome back, everyone. As we wrap up today's session, I want to share with you some opportunities for ongoing support. To assist districts in effectively selecting an approved Tier 1 comprehensive reading program so that the resource adopted ultimately leads to high-quality instruction and improved student outcomes, we are offering a one-hour webinar on Monday, November 20th from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The webinar will offer a more in-depth understanding of how best to use some of the resources previewed today to support your local adoption process. The registration link can be accessed using the QR code on the left of the screen. We will also be offering another HQIR coordinators convening in the spring, and we are seeking your input on the topics addressed. We ask that you complete a brief survey about today's session and topics that you would like to see on the spring agenda. We're offering ELA credit for your participation today, but you must complete the survey to request your certificate. The link to the survey will be placed in the chat, or you can access it by utilizing the QR code on the right of your screen. On the next slide, you'll see our contact information. Um, so Karen, if you can bump us to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you have questions regarding content in today's session, please reach out to the point of contact on the screen. We appreciate your time today. Have a great day, everyone.